And the crew of Columbia has a go for the deorbit burn. They're maneuvering the spaceship now in order to fly uh, upside down and backwards as is necessary to uh, re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Even though this flight has been shorter than planned, a great deal of important work has been done. Morton Dean in Houston reports now on the highlights of this flight of Space Shuttle 2. On November 4th, the Columbia was just about half a minute from making history, half a minute from making the first return flight to space when the clock stopped. T-minus 31 seconds, and we have held at the T-minus 31 second point. Two hours later, the bad news. But there has been a determination made that we are going to scrub for the day. An oil filter had clogged up. Some lubricating oil in a power system had become contaminated. The flight was postponed eight days. A new date and a new problem. We had two random failures in the same portion of an MDM. A third one was flown in from the west coast. It arrived here at the Kennedy Space Center at about 9 o'clock. The launch was delayed from early morning to mid-morning. It was astronaut Dick Truly's birthday is 44. The astronauts did not have their usual pre-flight breakfast. They had a pre-flight birthday party. The icing on the cake would come a bit later when the big candles were lighted at last. And lift off of America's space shuttle, and the space shuttle has cleared the tower. Plagued by problems, the mission would achieve many of its goals, but it would come home early. Trouble in a fuel cell creating the possibility of an explosion. The cell was drained and made safe. And it is uh, literally uh, dead, cannot be restarted. Uh, so the rest of STS-2 uh, will be accomplished on uh, two fuel cells. But NASA didn't want to take the risk of running a five-day mission on only two fuel cells. Okay, you get to hear the bad news one more time then. We're running a minimum mission and you'll be coming in tomorrow. Oh, uh, okay, that's not so good. The astronauts quickened the pace of their activities to achieve as many of the major test objectives as possible during the shortened mission. Last evening, Engel and Truly had a long-distance call from a visitor to Mission Control in Houston. Well, I care, and again, God bless you both, and all of us here are watching with great pride. Morton Dean, CBS News, Johnson Space Center, Houston. And that last picture that you saw on videotape was that Canadian arm, which was one of the major ex experiments uh, conducted, already conducted, during the flight of Space Shuttle 2, that Canadian arm up and out of the opened uh, a payload area from the Space Shuttle and, of course, in the background, uh, Earth. With me at our CBS News studios here in New York uh, today is Monty Dunbar, astronaut who's been helping us with this uh, second of the Space Shuttle missions. Monty, using our model and very quickly, uh, I think perhaps we can use it to explain to people what's happening with the spaceship at the moment. They have the go for the deorbit burn. They're now going to come back down to Earth, hopefully safely. They turn it over and fly it upside down and backwards. Oh, that's true. What we're trying to do is reduce our orbital velocity so we slow down enough to come back into the Earth's atmosphere. A, if we pretend that our velocity is that way, we've turned around. We're, we are firing these orbital maneuvering system engines. There are two of them, uh, reducing our speed only about 300 feet per second. After we've uh, acquired that speed, uh, our target speed, we'll then turn over and actually enter the Earth's atmosphere at about this attitude. Uh, You'll hear the phrase entry interface is defined as 400,000 feet, that point at which we start sensing the Earth's atmosphere. So this angle here with the direction of travel and the nose is about 40 degrees. It's called our angle of attack. And this is how we'll enter the Earth's atmosphere and generate a good portion of the heat on the bottom of the orbit. And that's the reason that these black uh, tiles are on the spacecraft at the moment is flying in this direction, upside down and backwards as it comes through. And as you explained, as it comes down through, nears the Earth's atmosphere, over and this way. And the tiles that have to absorb so much of that friction from the atmosphere are under here. Now, you're an engineer, uh, expert in tiles. Were you concerned that the spacecraft lost a few tiles the last time? I think that uh, most of us were very confident in the thermal protection system and its design, its ability to uh, you know, accommodate the amount of heat that you see on re-entry. There's always a concern that you've tested enough. W when we uh, designed our test uh, 
uh, apparatus and our procedures, we took these tiles through 100 missions. Again, it's a 100 mission reusable vehicle, and we subjected them to temperatures in excess of 2300 degrees Fahrenheit for that amount of time. We had a lot of confidence. Uh, I think that the uh, possibility of losing a tile was very remote, and in some areas it may not make a difference, in other areas they were critical. Over the next, let us say, 20 minutes, when is the most dangerous time for the astronauts? Well, of course, there are some times that would be more critical than others, but in terms of heating, we'll hear of entry interface uh, probably uh, some 20 minutes before landing. At the time that we enter blackout, shortly after that, we'll enter peak heating as well, about 320,000 feet. And you'll see, uh, this is when the orbiter, as it comes in, the crew will see a pink glow over the top of the nose. And these tiles under here will see about 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. And the nose, in fact, may get up to about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is with about 10 minutes of peak heating in terms of uh, the thermal environment is, is critical. CBS News coverage of the return of the space shuttle will continue in just a moment. New instructions from the space controllers to the spacecraft and the astronauts. Change in runways. As we came on the air, you heard uh, Leo Krupp and Walter Cronkite saying at Edwards Air Force Base that the wind was up out there. And Leo Krupp, veteran test pilot who's helped us on many of these broadcasts, uh, expressed uh, at least uh, privately some of his concerns about the runway they're going to use. Now they've changed the runway. Bonnie Dunbar, our astronaut friend here in New York with us, what does uh, that mean? And uh, does it mean very much for the astronauts that they've changed the runway at Edwards Air Force Base? Well, I came in in the middle of the explanation. I'm sure it's because of winds. I heard runway 23. I listened for uh, you know, con confirmation of that. But really, all it means is that on the dedicated displays on board is that Joe Engel just put in 23 as the runway. And uh, guidance and navigation will take care of the So rest. not much difference. Not much difference. What are the chances that they will now change the landing site from Edwards Air Force Base to, say, White Sands, New Mexico? A very little on the basis of that. Do you think they'll come down at Edwards? Uh, it appears so at the present time. Now, we're roughly, what, four, four and a half minutes to the deorbit burn, about uh, one hour and two or three minutes from landing, if all goes according to schedule. That's true. Mort Dean and astronaut Paul Weitz are in the 1G trainer, where the crew has trained at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Mort, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dan and Bonnie. Uh, Paul, you've come back from space. You were up there in Skylab, the first Skylab mission. Is it disconcerting for a astronaut to hear just shortly before re-entry that you've got to make a change, you'll be coming in on a different runway? No, not in this case, Mort. Uh, Joe understands the rationale between the choices or what governs the choices, and uh, he knows what the objectives are going to either one of them are. Does that require anything different from the uh, pilot or the commander, or is it all done by machines, by computers? Well, it, uh, basically, the, the maneuvering of the vehicle, the steering of it, uh, is done by the computers. But the crew will type into, through again, through our good old keyboard here, using displays on the CRTs, the cathode ray tubes here, we'll give instructions to the computers to now go to runway 23, as Bonnie said instead of runway 15. How much flying will the astronauts actually do on the way down? Uh, this particular flight is a very busy one in that we are trying to determine what are called stability derivatives. How does this stability airplane... Stability derivatives. What Love are... the term NASA uses. <laughs> You're How... trying to find out what the plane, what the shuttle can do. What it does in response to aerodynamic upsets. That's correct. Okay. Uh, or uh, when things don't go smoothly. How does the thing fly? What are its real flying characteristics? How well does it corner would be an equivalent in a car? So they're putting the uh, spaceship through some unusual maneuvers, uh, unusual as far as the first shuttle return. They are maneuvers start. that would not be necessary to perform the entry, but they are being performed in order to get the, this uh, aerodynamic data. That's correct. And they will not significantly affect the trajectory. Dan Engel and Truly are not sitting in their uh, uniform similar to ours, a sport jacket and tie, but they are wearing re-entry suits. Well, they're the emergency escape suits that they wore at launch. They're the ones that do permit them, if necessary, heaven forbid, to survive an ejection. And they can eject up to, what is it, uh, after 100,000 feet? Below 100,000 feet, yes, that's correct, Mort. Well, there you are, Dan. Bonnie? Thank you very much, Morton Dean and astronaut Paul Weitz in Houston here in New York with uh, astronaut Bonnie Dunbar and standing by at Edwards Air Force Base in California, Walter Cronkite and uh, Leo Krupp. Now, where the astronauts are at the moment, they have started uh, at least one of their auxiliary power units. They are just about to go into the important D-orbit burn. The D-orbit uh, burn 
burn time should last, uh, Bonnie, check me on this figure, about two minutes and uh, 29 seconds. They'll be traveling at roughly what speed per hour? Well, in a deorbit burn, uh, we're close to about 18,000 miles per hour. And uh, we're not uh, deorbit, or really reducing that much uh, in terms of feet per second. I, that's more familiar to me. <laughs> it's about 313 feet per second. In the burn, I believe, it's about two minutes and 55 seconds. That's enough of a reduction to bring us out of orbit, uh, take us down to uh, a new orbit that, if allowed to continue, would be two mile, minus two miles. <laughs> okay.